Please take out your Bible and let's go to battle one more time. Thank you for loving God. Many of you have been to all five of the services and I am so impressed. If that's you, lift your hand real high. You, you haven't missed it. Look at the hands. Wow. That, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. James has radically shifted my life. When I read James, I thought I need to rededicate my life because I'm not living a lot of the things that he says. And I know that you're going to pick up on this in just a moment. But grab a pen because sometimes God will talk to you and you'll hear things I'm not even saying. Pastor Mike, I love you, brother. You are an amazing man of God. And I have never seen a church and a pastor fit so perfectly. Now, I've been to some places where my grandson Noah says, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and smell all the people. <laughs> There's not that going on here. <laughs> I was a running back in high school. We're on the five-yard line. We need to score. Coach sends in a play through one of the wide receivers, 38 to the right. And I said to the guys, no, that's me. <laughs> I really did. No, that's me. I hadn't scored a touchdown the whole game. Matter of fact, I hadn't scored a touchdown my whole life. I really never had. So I'm over there just terrified. And, and uh, quarterback, hot, and he gives it to me. And they threw me back 10 yards. And I got up. I found my helmet. And I... <laughs> And I put it on, and I turned to the coach, like, see, see, coach. You do. We get in the huddle. The coach has sent in a play to the wide receiver, and he whispers, 38 to the right. And I said, boys, our coach is crazy. <laughs> and I turned to him, no. And he said, get in there and do that. Well, everybody on the other team knows who's going to carry the ball. It's the superstar fullback. Got all the touchdowns. Cheerleaders loved him. I hated him. And... <laughs> quarterback fakes the him gives it to me I run to the end zone line and I did something I got chewed out for I took that pigskin across the chalk line and scored a touchdown and I still remember that guy in the zebra outfit yelling touchdown but here's what's burned on my brain my father is standing here at the end of the end zone and he starts yelling and informing everybody that I'm his son. And he, that's my boy. That's my boy. I'll never forget that. God is not a God always looking for you to mess up. He loves you. He doesn't want you to mess up. But we got to stop thinking of God as just some wild animal ready to hurt us or destroy us. He loves you so much he gave up his son. Romans 8, he that spared not his own son... Don't you think you'll deliver us all? If you love the Lord, shout amen. amen. So we're going to talk about broken things for a couple of minutes. God wants to heal your broken things. I know there's things that are in your past that you can't stop thinking about. And people have hurt you and they may not even know it. Or they may have hurt you and they got over it 20 years ago. And it still wakes you up at night. And you see them and you get a knot in your stomach. There's some broken things I want to deal with, but you've got to help me. You've got to blast your past. You've got to stop dwelling on what happened before. Luke 9 says, no man is fit for the kingdom if he's plowing and he looks back. Lot's wife looked back. There's nothing back there for you. The sins of the world, the junk and the bondage you used to live in, let it go. Philippians 3 says, forgetting those things that are behind you. Forget them. And reaching forth. Unless your name is Paul McCartney, quit singing about yesterday. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but it felt good to say. James chapter 5. Oh, yes, this is a great chapter. Look at verse 16. Matter of fact, please put a mark by verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. That's a hard thing to do, to say, I was wrong. Everybody say, I was wrong. Was, wrong. was that hard to say? <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to be the one to apologize. If it wasn't for me, 
Carol and I would never argue. <laughs> I've got this figured out. It's true. She's got the most loving, gentle spirit. And I admire, I admire how much she loves Jesus. It's just, you ever meet somebody and they're so full of Christ that it draws you to them? Or people who think they're full of Christ and they're just full of mischief and baggage and you hang around with them and, and you want to wipe it off of you. You ever met those people? Raise your hand if you've met somebody who takes a light that's in you and dims it a little bit. Yeah. Hey, listen, you don't have to answer every call. You don't have to, to say, well, they're asking me to go and, and gossip. Or you can look to the people and say to yourself, we're not home. <laughs> Please don't let the past bind your future. Oh, this is good. It's hard to drive all day in reverse. You were not made to go backwards. Number two, broken dreams. It's what I want to deal with for just a moment. I love this guy in the Bible named Jeremiah. The Bible says, Jeremiah was a... <laughs> Did you hear it? Bullfrog. <laughs> My opinion of this church is shrinking. I just want you to know. I don't know what's happening in this room right now. Man. Thank you. He's the weeping prophet. You read Jeremiah 1. It's the great pro-life passages. Sanctified in the womb. I love that. Chapter 2 starts out, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. And man, he's given the truth. And people don't like him, but he's operating in the perfect will of God. Then he starts hanging around with the deadheads. The, the people who drag you down into a pit. And suddenly he's acting like the people he used to despise. And he's complaining and griping. And you get over to chapter 15 of Jeremiah. In just two verses, he says, I, me, or my, ten times. The first indicator of you backsliding, it's all about you. It's all about you. Please be careful. You can be a very nice person and backslide. Don't make it about you. Job prayed for himself for 42 chapters. You get to the last one, chapter 42 and verse 10. The Lord removed the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Sometimes you just need to say, today, Lord, I'm just praying for others and not me. Even though you need it, God's impressed with humility. He loves it. He's drawn to it. Broken dreams. Out in the lobby tonight. Somebody was asking me, what were these other points that you didn't give? <laughs> I got so excited about this church, and this has never happened to me before. I'd be in the middle of a story, and you start clapping or laughing or crying, and you, you threw me. You distracted me. I can think of three illustrations I gave this week that I didn't finish, and it's your fault. <laughs> I told you about my first sermon and the babies crying and the teenagers laughing and the lady praying for me. But I didn't tell you this. After the service was over, I ran and hid behind the church. Because I didn't want anybody to lie and say that was a great sermon. Because Christians will lie. <laughs> it was terrible. Terrible. And so I'm hiding because I want everybody to leave. I'm literally behind the church in the dark. And a lady named Polly finds me. What are you doing? I said, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm hiding. She said, why? I said, because of that terrible sermon I just preached. And she said, yeah, it was awful. <laughs> supposed to tell me it was great. No, she wanted to operate on that level five. Level five. A total honesty. Hardly any of us operate on level five. Level one is high. Level two, hi, how you doing? Level three, can I pray for you? Level four, are you hurting? But level five is the woman at the well. Remember when Jesus says, give me some water, and, and they have the discussion, and then he says, hey, go call your husband. She says, I don't have one. And he could have left it right there, but he couldn't. Yeah, you, you've had five husbands. That's what he told her. You've had five husbands, and you're shacking up with a guy now. I love her response. I perceive thou art a prophet. Is that a great line? I perceive thou art a prophet. And she runs into town and gets a bunch of people. 
Come see a man. Why? Total honesty. Total honesty. So, for an hour and a half, Polly called me back into the ministry. She said, God's called you to do this, and you're not going to give up on it. Just keep trying. Well, I'm still trying. I don't think I'm a very good preacher, but I sure have fun. And if that doesn't sit well with you, you ain't going to love heaven. The other broken we need is uh, broken hearts. When was the last time you cried for somebody who you know is not making it into heaven? D.L. Moody said, never preach about hell without a tear in your eye. The Lord is not willing that any should what? Several years ago, I'm st standing in the lobby, shaking hands. And a lady named Nancy comes up to me and says, you're going to have to help me with my little granddaughter. She gave her heart to Christ this morning at church and thinks you never get to come back. I don't even know where that came from, but she would not go out those doors. I mean, she dug her heels in and she, just a little four-year-old girl named Brick, who, Brick, Brooke, and she got saved that day. And Nancy says, Pastor Don, help us. So I knelt down and I said, what's the matter? She said, I don't want to leave. I could never come back. And I said, you can come back on Wednesday night. She did that. And she jumps and squeezed my neck till it hurt. She really, it just, and then she just ran off. And God said to me, why don't you feel that way? Mm, getting quiet in here. She came back a couple of weeks later and handed me this envelope. It says, to God from Brooklyn. And you open it up inside, and here's what she put. Her picture and a dollar. And she said to me, give this to God for me. That's what she said. Give this to God for me. And I said, oh, I'd love to give this to God for you, Brooke. Why do you want me to give this to God? And she said, because I know him. Whoa. Whoa. Not because I love him or I gave my heart to him. I know him. I want to challenge you to stop listening to big people and start kneeling and listening to the little ones. They're a lot more fun. Amen. A little girl named Rebecca, nine years old, rushed out. She turned to me and said, God's in this house, and then just ran. <laughs> Whoa, get back here. I'd never met her before. She says, I'm Rebecca. I'm nine. I said, what do you mean God is in this place? And she said, Brother Steve, he loves the worship. I don't even know if she was one of us because I haven't seen her since then. Wow. God is saying to you, even in your brokenness, I love you. Matter of fact, I love you more. And then a broken home. Satan's number one target right now is the home. Protect your home. Protect it. Don't let people curse in your home. One guy came to our house and he was using foul language and he turned to me and said, will I drink in the next life? I said, I don't know, but you'll sure smoke. <laughs> you know, they're slow tonight, but they're worth waiting on. You know, <laughs> write this down somewhere. Deuteronomy, just put D-E-U-T, 726. It says, do not bring an abomination into your house or you will be a cursed thing like it. Whoa. Deuteronomy 7.26, do not bring an abomination to your house or you will be a cursed thing like it. And then broken finances. We all go through that. We make terrible mistakes. Please don't ever stop giving to God. He goes to war for you. When you obey him, he loves to stand beside you as a mighty warrior. I don't know why, but as soon as we moved to Fort Smith back in 89, somebody drove by the church and shot the glass door. And the note went around everywhere. And we got some notification from the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Pray for Don Hutchings. He's been shot. <laughs> That's not what happened. And then somebody marches in and steals my ovation guitar. Gorgeous guitar. 
worth a thousand dollars, has a pickup in it, and a balladeer, Glen Campbell style. And I, I just couldn't believe somebody would come into the church in the middle of the day and stole it. Found out later, uh, I called my insurance company. What should I do? They said, go get another one. We'll pay the whole thing. Excellent. So I went to a local uh, music store in Fort Smith. And I said, here's what I'm looking for. Uh, ovation guitar with the pickup, balladeer with the Glen Campbell and the stuff. And they said, we've got just what you need. They went back to the back room and brought out my guitar. <laughs> my guitar. He had asked them for $40, and they gave it to him. Had a drug problem, stole from other churches, did a three and a half years in prison. He could have asked for 600 bucks, and they'd have given it to him. But because he didn't know what he had, it cost him. Some of you, come on, listen to me. You don't know what's inside of you. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Do you believe that? So we've got to, to say to God, help my finances. I give it all to you. And then a broken body. A broken body. When you, you develop an illness or brain trouble or heart trouble, you go to God and say, help me, help me, help me. And then a broken nation. Can you believe how low this nation has sunk. It's just stunning. It's shocking. How did we get here where we who come and share the truth are not only called intolerant and bigots, but some people say we ought to be arrested. You ought to be arrested for being pro-life or being arrested for God's plan that we promote a marriage between a man and a woman. When did that become wrong? How did it happen that we are now the problem instead of the solution? We have got to pray for America daily and ask God, do a miracle, God. Do a miracle. I love the book of Judges. Some rough dudes in that book. One of them is Gideon. Gideon is hiding. God sends a message. There's 32,000 Midianites. And Gideon is supposed to go and take them all on. He does the fleeces. You know the story. I love what the angel says as he's hiding. Hey, Gideon, mighty man of valor. Really? And then I'm not a man of valor. He says, I'm weak. I'm the least of all my family. And the angel says, go in this thy might. Gideon does the battle. You know the story. They, get, they have 32,000. And God says to Gideon, too many. Because when you guys win the war, you're going to take credit for it. There are times when God wants to be outnumbered. Because then he gets to show off. So God says to Gideon, tell any one of my soldiers, if they're afraid, to go back home to mama. 22,000 were terrified and went back home. 22,000! Now, I'm not good at geography, but I think there's 10,000 left. And out of these 10,000, God said, still too many. Go down to the river. They all go down to the river. 9,700 take their sword and put it off to the side and just start lapping like a dog. God said to Gideon, I can't use them. Watch this. Don't miss this. These 9,700 are not afraid, right? They passed the fear test. They just don't know how to fight. And that's where we are in America today. We don't even know how to fight the devil. How do you rebuke somebody? How do you? We're so afraid of our reputation. Galatians 1.10, who am I trying to impress, God or men? If I impress men, I'm not the servant of God. Here's another thing that's broken. Our love for Jesus. Our love for Jesus. Remember the day you gave your heart to Christ and you'd see a picture like that, just whew, chills, maybe a tear or two. Have you stopped looking east? Have you stopped reading your Bible like you used to or going to Sunday school? Oh, I'm, I'm just saying God loves you, but there can be a whole lot more, more joy and power inside of you if you go back to your first love. That's right. I'm going to share something. I hesitated to bring this up. I've never shared this with anybody in any church. 
But yesterday I'm flying down Towson Avenue going miles an hour. And God threw this inside of me. Fill the void. Fill the void. In other words, there's some empty places. You've run from sin. But there's some holes there that you need to fill with worship and praise and fun with Christians. There's many things that you used to do, maybe full of hate, and you fill the void with healing. From losing to winning. You get on fire for God and everybody ought to know it. Those F-35s that flew over today, that's the sound of freedom. And I love it. I love it. And uh, people say, why are they so loud? Well, you get on fire, you're going to get loud, baby. Amen. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> we can edit that out, I hope. <laughs> baby, what are we doing? Okay. His name is Danny. It's my older brother. He's in heaven accidentally shot and killed. My uncle was trying out the new shotgun. Danny was eight, rushed after the baseball, and my uncle Bob hollered, pull! Pow! I couldn't believe my eyes. I'm six years old. My great big father rushes over and picks up his firstborn, and the shirt went up, and I could see all the holes in the blood, and they... They rushed him 26 miles to the nearest hospital. And he lived for 20 hours. Nurse said his temperature got up to 109. And he starts telling my unsaved father about Jesus. My dad knew nothing about Christ. So Danny laying there in this bed said, Dad, would you go get Mom's big Bible? Sure, son. He goes down to the car and Danny starts telling him stories. Let me tell you something. If you teach children, I know sometimes it looks like they're not listening. But Danny told story after story after story that he had learned at this awesome Baptist church we went to. Did you know that Danny would witness to everybody at school? Everybody. Teacher pinned a note to his shirt to my mother. Dear Mrs. Hutchings, keep this boy quiet. He'd line us all up in the backyard, and he'd preach to us. And, he'd say, and what's my favorite verse, Don? I don't have to tell you. You know how it is with your brother. You don't. What's my favorite? I don't have to tell you. you go, Boom! Trust in the Lord with all your heart. <laughs> Lean not to your own understanding. And then Danny said, do you see him? Dad, do you see him? The angels were in the room, and, and he's gone. My father had to take each one of the eight Hutchings children it's individually and he put us on his knee and he said we lost Danny today and I thought how do you lose somebody when you know right where they are he's probably preaching up in heaven and I want to tell the angels say what he wants to hear please trust in the Lord with all your heart so I watched my mother handle this and I just couldn't believe it She's, I said, Mom, how, do you, how can you take this with your son dying a brutal death? She said, I thought it was an honor that God chose to call my son home. What? I'm not there yet. I, I'm a long ways from there. I want to get there. But my mother's the kind of lady who, before she went to heaven two years ago, she was witnessing to a lady and convinced that the lady was going to get saved and the lady rejected salvation. And my mother calls me and she's heaving and sobbing and crying. And I said, Mom, are you okay? No, I'm not okay. Because she won't accept my Jesus. God give us that desire again. There's a void in the Hutchings home years ago. So my mother, who was so spiritually militant. We went to Israel together. And there's this Israeli soldier outside of Jerusalem. My mother goes up to him and says, can I hold your machine gun? That's my mother. And that's an Israeli soldier. Can I wear your helmet? And that's just the kind of person she wants. She wasn't putting on. That's just who she was. And when she walked into a room, 
Man, the mice jumped up on the chairs, I'll tell you. <laughs> People responded because she wasn't embarrassed, but here's the point. The void. There's a void in all of our lives, many voids. You've got to fill the void. So my mother and father had another child, and they named her Danette after Danny. She's so full of life, so full of Jesus, crazy, funny, loud. Let me tell you of another void. I told Carol today, if I start crying, what am I going to do? She said, just keep going. You ever get attached to a dog and you wonder, where's that coming from? I mean, it just, and when they pass away, it's like part of you died. Not just part of your family, but like a part of you. And we had this dog, Danny, had her for several years. And on the 1st of October, just last week, she had a heart attack and passed away. I have never cried so much in my life. I mean, just trying to talk. And I, I we rushed her to the vet's office. And I, I went in and said to the lady, I, my dog just, and I couldn't even get it out. Void, hollow place, an emptiness. So that very day, October 1st, 2024, Carol and I drove to Centerton, Arkansas, and picked up Danny Boy. <laughs> Look at that. She's watching TV on the right side, and she's trying to kiss the dog that's on the screen. He is. So fun. Totally. Danny girl was mellow, chill, singing Three Dog Night song. This guy, he is just, he, he runs and jumps. He runs and jumps. I'm anxious to see what kind of guard dog he'll be because if people come into the house with Danny girl, she would lick them. And with this dog, maybe we'll have a protector. What are you talking about, preacher? You've got to give up some things, but fill the void. Fill the void with God and his glory. I love that you have so many activities at this church. Don't stay by yourself. First thing God ever saw that wasn't good was for man to be alone. Don't be alone. We need each other. Hey, when all the freckles get together, it makes a nice tan. We need each other. <laughs> Amen. I tell churches, if somebody's sitting alone, I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong place. So tell them we need each other. Forsake not the fellowship together. Even the lone ranger had Tonto. <laughs> you cannot survive on your own. There'll be a void there that will mess you up spiritually. Stay in Sunday school. Stay in Wednesday nights. Stay. If there's somebody in your life who's lost, don't give up. Because you're filling that void with Jesus. If the church in America could get a hold of this, exchanging darkness for light. Yesterday, Roger let me sit at his table at a lunch we were at. And God had just been throwing this stuff. Fill the void, fill the void, fill the void, fill the void. And I walked into the, the church, and this first guy stood and shook my hand and said, we've exchanged light for darkness. And I said, what did you say? He said, it's all about an exchange. And that's true. Maybe you're wondering why you can't be strong for Jesus. It's because you haven't emptied out everything. Get rid of the bondage. Say that with me. Get rid of the bond. Oh, one more time. Get rid of the bondage. Father, I trust you. You're doing a magnificent work right here. You're doing a healing for broken people. And Father, we know that things go wrong sometimes, but we don't have to go with them. We know that Without you, it seems hopeless for this nation. But we're not living without you. We're following you step by step. I thank you, Lord, for the ingredients you've given to us. Forgive us for trying everything else but Jesus. I pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.